Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. On this show, we're always talking about learning. One of the challenges I have, especially as I get older, is remembering the stuff I just learned. Psychologist Dr. Peter Vishton is helping me to do this. He's got a series at Wondrium. It's called Scientific Secrets for a Powerful Memory. And most surprising to me wasn't that brain games and puzzles and stuff aren't one of the best ways to enhance memory. I learned from Dr. Vishnan that it's exercise that is one of the best creators of these synapses in the brain to benefit memory. How come I'd never heard that before, you know? That's the kind of stuff that makes Wondrium a hugely beneficial, mind-expanding, encyclopedic resource. Great for science, business, the arts, DIY aficionados, learners of all shapes and stripes, taught by experts in their fields in a format that really is a lot of fun. As curious learners, I know that you will love Wondrium. And right now, Wondrium is offering you a special deal, a free 22-day trial offer to celebrate the new year. But you need to sign up with my special URL, wondrium.com slash Seth. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Seth. And get your learning on today, wondrium.com slash Seth. Celebrating show number 600. I was thinking about how we've commemorated these landmarks in the past. And, you know, like show 300, we had a big live event in Dallas. 500, I had Natalie join me. For 600, I have no idea. Like, I didn't schedule or plan anything. I just thought maybe we'd spend it together and take your calls and have conversations about whatever it is that's on your mind. It's sort of like the Christmas holiday. Everybody was asking me, what do you want? Like they kept thinking I had built it up to be some big thing. And I enjoy Christmas. What do you want for Christmas? People would ask me. And I was like, "Ah, I'm good. You know, I'm good. And I, I mean that. It's not don't buy anything out of our obligation because I feel guilty. It's like I'm, I'm good. I was a kid. I remember it was all about the crap that was under the tree, right? Tear open the wrapping paper and then you get a bunch of stuff. And then two days later, it's piled in the corner and half of it's broken, you know. And uh, now I just think, you know, what do I want? I want intangibles or, you know, the abstract stuff. I don't need things. I don't need stuff. You know, I, I, do, I want good health for all my people. I want you to be in a good place. I would like to live in a less crazy planet. That's what I want. I want to live in a less superstitious world. That's what I want. You know, I, I, want, I want the insurrectionists to go to prison. That's what I want. I want the new Batman movie to not suck when it releases here this summer. I want my dogs to live forever. That's what I want. I want people to use their turn signals on the highway. Like, when did that become controversial? You're going to change lanes? Let's communicate to other people what you're going to do. I want churches to pay taxes. I want Jeff Bezos to start feeding more hungry people. I want Twitter users and Facebook users to stop being so awful to each other. That's what I want. 
I want a good night's sleep. I want to not have to worry about the guy in the checkout line not wearing a mask who's coughing himself into a fit. I want Natalie to be safe in her job, which is in health care. I worry about her. I want tacos. Lots of tacos in 2022. That's what I want. I want music that moves me. I want my car to start in the morning. I want to publish my next book without any incidents. I want you to achieve your goals and dreams for the new year. You know, I, I want 2022 to bring you the things and the people and the circumstances that you want and need. I want things to be good, at least better than they have been. I want us to be able to feel that as well. That's what I want. You know, I don't do New Year's resolutions either. I used to try that. Three weeks into it, I was, you know, yeah, I'm thinking if you're going to make a resolution, just do it regardless of whatever the time of year is. We can see this at the fitness centers. I remember I used to go in, uh, I was a member for a while at one, and I was there for a few years, and I went in regularly, not that I was really in shape, but I was just trying to be healthier. And November, December, January saw this flood of people who signed up for their new membership, right? And they had the employees waiting at the door for these people to come in who were going to get in shape and be healthier. And I think that's an amazing goal. I'm not discounting that in any way. But you could see on the faces of a lot of the people who walked in with these New Year's resolutions, they were going to last about three weeks, and then it's cheesecake factory time, right? It's sit on the couch time. It is not be mobile, not be active, not exercise, not lift weights. You know, this was a temporary thing. I get wanting it, but they simply weren't going to get there. You could see it, but they signed up for that year. That membership in advance got a little bit of a discount, showed up for three or four weeks, and they were never seen again. (laughs) So I don't do New Year's resolutions, you know. At show 600, what do I want? I want to help people. I want to be relevant. I want to be something that adds to your life, whatever that means. Some people have been with me for the whole run since we started in 2010. I'm floored by it. You know, you've heard my bullshit before. You've got my story memorized. You've been through all the wide spectrum of subjects and topics and everything we've done and talked about and the guests we've had. You're still here. I mean, what what in the world can I possibly ask for that I don't already have? Tremendously privileged to be able to to do what I love, what I care so much about. And I do have a fire in my belly, even after all these years, about the damage done, indoctrination, superstition, religious privilege, anti-science rhetoric that harms people, knowing that so many people still need to be rescued. And I don't think it's arrogant to say that. Who do you think you are? to assert that other people should think like you. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there are some things that have been demonstrably disproven. Teachings that are simply wrong. Historically wrong, scientifically wrong, morally wrong. And it's okay to say it harms people and we're going to help carve a way out. Right? It's still their path. They can still decide to walk it, or they can carve a path of their own. we got to tell them it's okay. It's all right. I've been doing this since 2009. I'm still interested, and I hope you are as well. I'm doing a broadcast coming up that's uh, featuring atheist comedians, like some of the more well-known comedians. I'll be honest and extremely candid, and I'm not slapping anybody in the face here. I'm not trying to. But when I do a conference... One of the most terrifying things that I hear is, oh, on Saturday night, we have a local comedian. That's terrifying to me. It's terrifying. There are probably two comedians I've heard in a decade of doing conferences that were remotely funny. And the rest, honestly, the rest of them, it's uncomfortable. And it's not just because I don't have a sense of humor, because I'd like to, even though I don't enjoy most stand-up, I don't think I am that disconnected from what is funny. It's a subjective thing, but yeah, 
You can tell the people who are reading a script or sticking or or trying too hard, and then there are people who are genuinely funny. And somebody says, we have a comedian lined up. Oh, shit. I think I'm busy. I usually sit near the back. Ten minutes in, after I've made an assessment, and it's usually not good, I slide my way out the door into the lobby down the hall, and I find the restaurant for some dessert or just scoot up to my room and call my wife. (laughs) I'm just saying. But there are some popular comedians, some legendary comedians who are genuinely funny. George Carlin, genius, right? That kind of thing. Tim Minchin. Genius, that kind of thing. So I got a show coming up on atheist comedians, and we're just going to do some really cool stuff like that here as we kick off 2022. And I just mostly, I think, want to spend the day, this 600th broadcast, and we can reminisce a little bit, uh, but this is just us, you and me, hanging out, being friends, being family. Is that okay? Nothing special planned, no confetti, no glamorous stuff, no fancy music, no bells, no whistles, just us. That's enough for me. I hope it's enough for you. Charles, thank you so much for calling. Are you with me? Yes, I am. Thanks for calling. What's on your mind, my friend? For the next year, I would like us to reinstate the fairness doctrine in the news. Now, for those, let me clarify for some people who aren't familiar with the Fairness Doctrine. There used to be a federal regulation for, especially news broadcasters, that they had to present, and I know this is sticky, but they had to present uh, more than one side to the specific story. So I'm not making a false equivalence argument, but what it was designed to do was to prevent the kind of Fox News stuff that we see, where someone can give only one side of a story And the Fairness Doctrine was cast down in the 80s, which paved the way for these hugely partisan sort of propaganda wings posing as news. And I'm not letting CNN or MSNBC off the hook either. But uh, the Fairness Doctrine also paved the way for a lot of right-wing radio talk show hosts who essentially went on. And whole radio stations that were being sold and marketed as news stations essentially became right-wing propagandists. You don't see it as much on the left. That hasn't really taken off. (laughs) But uh, we have seen it certainly among the uh, hardcore right-wing. So is that a fair assessment, Charles? Yes. For instance, a lot of this so-called people that are following the critical race theory are now beginning to use it for ideological purposes. And there's been some pushback on that. I would like our schools to have a much higher standard of accuracy in their teachings. For instance, I haven't seen anybody mention Cecil D. Mill's Birth of a Nation. For, oh, so, uh, so let me and, uh, uh, let me try to dial it in here. Your point is, is that we should be teaching the facts of our history, even the tremendously horrible and tragic facts of our history, because it is actual history and something that we must acknowledge and learn from, whether or not it's a support of white supremacy, whether or not it's institutionalized racism. Acknowledging the blemishes that we have here in our nation is not a betrayal of the nation. Would that be a fair rephrasing of what you're trying to say? Yes. We're a mixed bag, and we should teach the whole story, not just what happens to somebody's ideological agenda. I appreciate that addition to our 600th broadcast. Thanks so much for calling. You're welcome. Have a good one. All right. See you later. Uh, DeMille didn't direct Birth of a Nation of somebody else. I don't I don't know who it was, but it wasn't uh, Cecil B. DeMille, for those who are checking. I've got 312. Oh. Hi, who's this? Uh, this is Polly. Hi, Polly. Thanks for calling. What do you have for us today? Just uh, thank you for being you. Um, <laughs> thank you. And also happy Festivus. <laughs> <laughs> Festivus for the rest of us. A wonderful season that, in my opinion, does spill into the month of January. So the airing of grievances and all of that. That's awesome, Polly. What else is going on? Um, I was a little 
little bummed that I missed your cult broadcast because I was um, about 20 some odd years ago in um, University Bible Fellowship as a cult, which is like a Christian cult. They actually send missionaries over from Korea, which is interesting. So I was thinking of like starting a YouTube channel that was somewhat based on like cults. And I was wondering if you had any like tips. Well, (laughs) uh, for what it's worth, I can tell you that if you have a story to tell, if you have something to contribute, I think you should definitely do it. I think it serves you. It feels good. I think it's therapeutic to get it out. I felt that way when I started my YouTube channel and podcast. It's a little more challenging, I think, these days because there are so many options, so many shows, so many broadcasts, you know, so many podcasts. So it'll be a little harder to get noticed. But if you are using the keywords that relate to your specific conversation, if you do it compellingly, if you Mm -hmm. are prepared, if you're doing good storytelling and you're being yourself, being honest and genuine, I don't see any reason why people wouldn't respond to the material. So, yeah, it's it's awesome. Do it for you and do it for those that you might be able to help. I think that's amazing, Polly. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Um, Keep on keeping on. (laughs) Thank you. And you do the same. (laughs) Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, we'll see you later. People always ask me, what can I do? I want to be a part of the solution. And I always say, well, start where you are and play to your gifts. 603. Hi, who's this? Hi, Seth. My name is Ashley. Thanks for calling, Ashley. Happy New Year. What's on your mind? I'm uh, interested in how, in, in the overall story of Christianity and, and likely other religions as well, but I'm not as familiar with other ones specifically to do with the way that God seems to be holding us responsible for a decision that wasn't really clear in the first place. You know, you look at the narrative of the garden, I know a lot of Christians don't believe that literally, but many of them do. Um, I know my parents do. And Adam and Eve seem to have no idea what, what eating of the tree would do, and yet they're condemned for eternity, and along, along with all of their descendants, for that. And if a parent were to put their children in, in the sort of situation that Adam and Eve were put in and then threaten to punish them forever, even if that parent then waived the sentence later on down the line, that would not be a good parent. It seems to me that that's one of the central issues with Christianity because it makes a mockery of what any good God should be. Well, I have a couple of things on that. First of all, God did tell them, and I pulled up Genesis 2.17, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God did lay out consequences. Of course, you and I are on the same page that because God placed the tree right in the path of their vulnerable and naive and impressionable children, he was more the tempter than Lucifer's serpent was. I I think it's the equivalent of throwing a live hand grenade into a nursery and then blaming the children for pulling the pin. If Adam and Eve was yeah, just an uh, allegory or metaphor, what do you think that would mean? Like, what do you think Christians believe that Adam and Eve is supposed to represent, if not a literal story? What do you think they take away from it? It's a good question. I know a decent number of Christians who don't take it literally, and it becomes more of a general redemption arc of, you know, humans are, are flawed, humans have, have issues that they can't solve. And so, you know, God comes along and helps them out, I guess. Um, Well, if I can jump in, though, quickly, uh, Ashley. So, do they still hold to an original sin? I mean, even though they don't believe that the original sin happened, it sounds like they still latch on to this idea that we're all born broken, right? Yes, I would say so, for sure. That's a strange connection for them to draw. Like, I wonder how they would respond if ever challenged on that. Either way, I mean, God still seems to have created or allowed allowed to come into existence through evolution or whatever other means imperfect beings and then blame them for being imperfect. Then you've got the God that makes his own arch enemy who created Lucifer, right, the fallen angel. God created Lucifer. God knows everything past, present, and future. He didn't foresee that Lucifer would fall. He didn't foresee that Adam and Eve would act imperfectly. He didn't see billions would end up in hell. You know, there were so many holes in this story. Yeah, and what really bothers me is that so many devout Christians, they just won't question it. 
They won't say, they won't apply their critical thinking here. Whereas they will with other religions, you know, with Islam. I know, I know, I know a couple of Muslims and a couple of Christians who have a lot of things to say to those couple of Muslims. Is like, yeah, if you were to turn that same critical eye that you turn on Islam to your own religion, you might find some issues there as well. And how much sense does it make anyway? I mean, it's like you and I go into prison because our great, 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 great grandfather got a traffic ticket. You know, it just it just makes no yeah. the whole idea of an inherited sin nature, and we are all born broken, unworthy. Right? The Bible says there is no one worthy, no not one. So we're blamed for a condition that we can't help. Christopher Hitchens once said that we are created sick and commanded to be well. This makes no sense. I think you raise some really good points, Ashley. Yeah, the only the only view of God that I could come to that would the Christian God that I could come to that would be consistent is a God who is not generally benevolent, who is solely out to kind of fool people into thinking that He did well for them so that they'll worship Him. You've obviously read the Old Testament, so yeah, good point, Sash. You're greatly appreciated, my friend. Happy New Year! Thanks for calling. You as well. Thank you. Right, see luck. you later. Six zero seven. Hi, who's this? Hey, Seth. It's. Uh... John from upstate New York. It's been a long time. How are you, sir? I'm well. Thanks for calling. What's on your mind, John? A couple of things. First, to elaborate or piggyback on a point from one of the first callers, I think Charles, about education. I can tell you, as an educator of history, you would be amazed at what curriculums pick and choose, particularly when they profile certain historical figures, especially in science. Speaking from the New York State curriculum, they profile, they go out of their way to profile individuals of the scientific revolution, like Carl Linnaeus and Isaac Newton, Galileo, Copernicus, you know, the usual suspects. But when you get to the Industrial Revolution, there is no mention in the current curriculum of Edward Jenner, of... Louis Pasteur, of Marie Curie, certainly not of Charles Darwin. So it is really interesting, and this I'm talking about the global history curriculum. It is fascinating and kind of horrifying to see what it is that educational curriculums choose to emphasize by who they profile, but also by whom they omit kind of reveals their cards a little bit. Are you speaking at the, uh, what, the high school level? Because I have a hard time. I mean, certainly they're teaching Pasteur yes. and Darwin at the college level, at least, right? Sure. I mean, not, I at, probably, not at Liberty but, University, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, oh, right? Oh, God, no. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am speaking at the uh, high school level, secondary level, that they don't emphasize those individuals who saved how many untold millions of lives throughout the generations with what they discovered and what subsequent scientists discovered. And yet they don't give them the same amount of profile time or emphasis as the Newtons and the Galileos. I'm not saying that those individuals don't deserve emphasis, but they should receive the same amount as the scientists who literally created the foundations for vaccines and modern medicines. And I've just always found that fascinating and yet ridiculous. Yeah, they helped to change the world, and they should be acknowledged for that. Mm -hmm. Good stuff, John. Anything else? As for, first of all, you know, happy 600. And just my last question for you is, what do you do to keep yourself motivated? Because, my God, I just, I find it difficult sometimes to avoid the urge to just throw my hands up and say, screw it, we're all doomed, nothing matters, and just fall into complete nihilism. How do you keep from doing that and keep yourself motivated? John, let me think about that one for a minute. Can I answer it off uh, um, after the call and see if I can come up with something that's... Absolutely. Yeah. John, Happy New Year. Thanks for calling. Absolutely. And much appreciated. Happy New Year to you, Seth. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. We'll see you later. It's, um, it's kind of a Barbara Walters question. Does anybody really care? Seth, what do you do to keep things fresh? Well, I mean, I guess we all feel that. Even when you do something you love, sometimes you hit a wall. I talked about this a few weeks ago. I had hit the wall. What am I going to do to bust through the wall? 
I used to struggle more with work-life balance. A lot of it had to do with the fact that I was obsessed with content creation because I felt like I had so much to say and I was making up for lost time. It was frustrating. I mean, even Natalie would tell me, you need, you know, you need to have more of a life because you're always in the studio. You're always traveling. You're always. And she was right. I didn't have equilibrium, but I've gotten better. You know, I, I, and it, for me, it's the little things. Having that balance has helped me. And, and after that, it's my inbox. I, I get, I mean, you should see the letters I get from people. Everybody's got a story. I busted out of a cult. I thought I was alone. I Google searched the word atheist, found the show. I used to be a pastor. And now I am helping to rescue other people. And I wanted to write and say thanks, or be a part of the conversation, or recommend this resource, or just share what happened to me. You know, when you hear the individual stories of people, it really is a shot in the arm, because you're reminded that it's not just a bunch of white noise. It's not just thousands of people in this sort of bland spectrum of statistics, but everybody's an individual. This broadcast doesn't hit 100,000 people, it hits one person in a hundred thousand different instances, you know, and it hits them in a different way, at a different place, as they navigate a different path, and they use it in a different way as well. I don't know, it's, it's, I'm babbling. (laughs) You get it, I'll shut up. Let's talk to Bob. Bob at 267, you with me? Yes, I am, Seth, hi. Thanks for calling on show 600. What do you have for us, my friend? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for all you do. You really do bring comfort to people. And uh, I just want to uh, tell you that I have looked in the past to try to track down uh, what this faith-based initiative, multi-billions, who is watching where it goes and how it's spent and how much you know, the, the religions who always position themselves right at the front row of the trough. Who is getting what? Where is it going? Who's doing the accounting? I can't find out. Um, is there someone in the atheist community who is a financial watchdog on things like this? And, you know, maybe we could get Phil Ferguson to, uh, to you know, put his x-ray vision on him, you know, you know? But where's the money going? And who is it? Who, who, where is it reported? For those who might be listening who aren't a part of the culture here in the United States, when he means faith-based initiatives, and correct me if I've misunderstood, but he's talking about the specific government incentives, often tax-related incentives that are supposed right. to benefit certain organizations that are almost always religious, theistically religious in nature, and suspiciously Christian in nature because somehow it's supposed to inject uh, financial benefit into our communities, which are supposedly largely Christian and raise the moral fabric of the whole country. And it's so problematic because there's a tremendous lack of accountability with this money. And it also crosses that uh, state church line. You know, we're not a church. We're a secular nation where religion is protected. But this whole idea of a faith-based initiative that's funded by tax dollars is crazy. I don't know who's tracking the money. I'm sure somebody is. Ferguson is the only, Phil Ferguson is the only financial guy I know. But if anybody who's listening has a resource, you can post it in the comments or you can drop me an email and I'll give you a signal boost on that. Yeah, it's it's big, big piles of money and it's unaccounted for slush fund and it Parts of that slush fund may be the reason why so many evangelicals got behind a certain candidate. Uh, maybe uh, little cuts on the side to the big wheels. But nobody's watching. Nobody's watching. And uh, basically, I think Catholics, most Catholics would be shocked to hear that Catholic charities is actually taxpayer money. It didn't come from Catholics. It didn't come from the Vatican. It's coming from taxpayers who are involuntarily sending money to religions. So, I mean, beyond the specific in-house charitable efforts by the Catholic Church, because I know there are some organic charitable efforts that happen within the church, but you're speaking about another revenue stream that's coming through. It's being filtered through 
government agencies on the taxpayer dime. Right. That's right. It's a handout to them. I, I, I would like to know where the money is going to uh, Jewish temples, to uh, mosques, to whatever religions are out there at the trough getting mo- taxpayer money. Well, let's find out if maybe somebody in the audience knows. We'll follow the comment sections, and if I find out that there's a resource, somebody who's doing investigative reporting, I'll do my best to get the word out for you, okay? I wish you and all your listeners a very peaceful and a happy New Year. You too, Bob. (laughs) Thanks for calling, brother. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. All right, bye. You know the one that gets me? The parsonage exemptions. Because, you know, the churches are 501c3 nonprofits. But they don't have to operate by the same rules as other nonprofit organizations in this country. And you got parsonage exemptions. You know, you got the pastors who can live for free and they can buy their stuff for free and their income streams are tax free. But there's a lot of money that moves in and outside of church circles where they don't have to itemize for the IRS in the way that other charities do. It makes me crazy. It makes me. American Atheists filed a lawsuit years ago demanding that churches have to follow the same guidelines of reporting that other 501c3 charities have to follow, and they lost the lawsuit. Don't tell me religious privilege does not survive and thrive in the United States. Jacob, appreciate you calling. You with me? Yes, I'm with you, Seth. How are you today? I'm well. Happy New Year. What's on your mind? In a new year, I want people to be more kind to one another. Amen, brother. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's just getting out of control lately. I have an example for you. I take the bus routes everywhere. It's easier for me since I don't have a car. And there's a homeless guy that lives at the main bus station, like sleeps out there and everything. And people pick on him and yell at him and do horrible things. And I'm always going over or give them food and money. And now I'm getting screamed at and everything because I'm like, and they said I'm enabling him to be homeless. And it's, you know, wh- where the hell did our humanity go? You know, I feel the same way in so many instances. I'm with you, man. I want to see a kinder world in 2022. You know, enough of this spitting on each other. <laughs> Often for sport, there's got to be more to life, right? Yeah. I mean, it seemed like for the past five years, everything has just kind of gone to shit. I mean, the past few years have really messed with everybody but i don't know it's like all the horrible people decided to come out of the woodwork and now we're here and it's getting upsetting you know yeah i listened to one of your other podcasts where your acquaintance of the tennis friend who passed away from covid and you know they're all like he just had a pre-existing condition and you you said you and jesus would be kicking him in a parking lot (laughs) and it's like because you, you and Jesus would agree on that, like, what, where do your humanity go and everything? And I still laugh about that, because if, if Jesus was around today, I mean, he would be killed. Because, I mean, this, just the way the real Jesus was, and it, it's just sad how we all lost our humanity lately. And, well, you know, I, you know if, if I can, you know, I'm not trying to blow sunshine at you, but, you know, I, I don't think it's all. I think there's a lot of good that's out there. It's just hard to see it. There's so much smoke mm-hmm. and fire and noise and insanity and screaming. It's overwhelming. I don't think we're wired for all of this. Plus, it's being fire hosed into our face every single day. But you're right. I mean, if you yeah. know, Jesus, the brown skinned immigrant, was in the United States right now, the temperature of the hardcore evangelical right would be as such that they would probably kick him out past the border and tell him to fuck off, you know? And I just, I totally understand the hypocrisy is maddening and numbing to see the lack of empathy for our fellow human beings. I saw somebody say, don't ever tell me that these MAGAs would take a bullet for their fellow Americans. They won't even wear a piece of cloth over their face for their fellow Americans. You know, it's really exposed. The really awful shades of humanity in these specific demographics and awfulness exists in so many forms. I think the best we can do is to try to to be the opposite of that, to demonstrate the good we want to see in the world. It sounds like a bumper sticker, but it's all I got, brother. Yeah, I recommend a video. I don't, I don't know who made it, but it, you ever heard of the Republican Jesus video? Republican Jesus. Haven't heard of it. It's on YouTube. They're kind of like embracing Republican ideas, and it's supposed to be Jesus. Uh, I give it a watch. I 
laugh every time because it's like somebody comes up to Jesus, you know, Jesus says, be kind to one another, you know, and everything, you know, help those who are sick. Well, one girl comes up, it's like, Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm sick. You know, could you heal me? And he's like, well, who would pay for it? You know, you know, and it's like. I saw another one there where Jesus is about to feed the 5,000. And uh, that somebody went up and they said, don't feed these hungry people. You'll just create a class of dependents. They need to pull themselves up by yep. their bootstraps so they can feed themselves. You know, the lack of compassion is staggering. It really is. I mean, but I'm trying to, you know, be more positive, do more art and more stuff. Hey, there's still good trying to help people. without being delusional. I think one of the best therapies is for us to uh, to try to remember and exemplify the good. And I hope goodness is coming your way for 2022. Okay? Okay. And I like your voices that you do. It makes me laugh every time, <laughs> just the way you ha- pitch your voice and everything. It just You remind me of Q from Star Trek. That's, That's awesome. Funny. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you. Take care. I appreciate you. You too. Take care. Sound like John Delancey? I'd take that. I take John Delancey. I see somebody in the chat who says, uh, I hate when atheist talk turns political. I'll tell you a secret. Everything is political. I wish we had the luxury of not talking about politics. Don't tell me that evangelical theology and religious privilege haven't infected politics. It's unavoidable. I would have my head in the sand. If we didn't occasionally have to talk about politics. Brings me no joy. I get some angry messages sometimes. How come you have to talk so much about evangelical Republicans? Doesn't bring me any joy. Drive me crazy. Why do I talk about them when they come after equality? (laughs) When they vilify me nationwide for being essentially the cause of all of our problems when they fabricate bullshit crises like the war on Christmas and stuff like that, whenever they're trying to infect our public high schools and public institutions and tear up the Constitution. I mean, I wish I had the luxury of saying, oh, let's talk about something else. But everything's political. The shit matters. The stuff they do is harming people, and you better believe it relates directly to religion, religious arguments, religious privilege, and we will continue to talk about this stuff as long as we have to in 2022. Brittany, thanks for calling on show 600. It's good to have you. Good to be here. I was kind of wondering, I get to take classes for free every semester since I'm a custodian at the University of Wyoming. I took the history of Christianity last semester, and nothing covered anything in my lifetime. Let me make sure I'm understanding. You took the class, the history of Christianity, and the curriculum did not include contemporary events regarding Christianity? The closest thing that we got to was Dr. King and a lot of the civil rights stuff, but nothing after Reagan years. Okay, well, we hardly covered that in class at all. Forgive my ignorance if I get this wrong, but I mean, if it's the history of Christianity, wouldn't it be a look back instead of at contemporary events? It, a bit of that, but a bit of, I guess, a lot of the people in the department don't seem to want to cover as much recent stuff. I took a Christianity and American culture class, and it was the same thing. They didn't tend to focus much on the contemporary. And I'm kind of wondering a bit of why, because he actually did bring up the four horsemen in his intro to religion class, but he didn't cover any contemporary responses in this class. By the four horsemen, you mean Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitch, and Daniel yes. Dennett, the quote-unquote new atheists, the four horsemen. Yeah, it didn't cover anything from that. He did in his intro class, but nothing in this one, and I don't know if we'll cover it in the history of non-belief next semester. Well, hang on. I mean, if they brought up the Four Horsemen, what was the overall angle on atheists in the United States? He kind of took the approach that they're kind of religious in their own right, and since it was such a big class, I really wasn't able to talk to him that much about it. 
everybody worships something kind of thing. They're just being religious about their atheism. They traded one faith for another, that kind of vibe. Yeah, that's a bit of what he got into. He was more referencing Dawkins in particular for that one, but just kind of the vibe that everyone is religious in their own regard. I can see a great many people in this audience who, if they were in that classroom, would be holding their hands up and saying, that's bullshit, because it is. But I've heard the everybody is religious in some way argument, I think. Uh, First of all, it's a fallacy. Secondly, it in no way validates the specific religion of Christianity. Saying everybody is religious is what? All it does is diminish Christianity. To me, it makes no sense. But I understand your frustration, Brittany, and uh, I hope the history of non-religion or whatever that class was that you're taking next, I hope it is uh, more fruitful and more interesting and more compelling for you. Hopefully so. I'll give you an update towards the end of that semester. All right. Have your people call my people and we'll talk. And Happy New Year, Brittany. Appreciate you very much. Happy New Year. All right. See you later. Bye. Everybody's religious about something. I've heard this from my own family. You just traded. You worship at the Church of Dawkins. Are you kidding me? (laughs) You see, I think this is part of how religious people who have been taught to think in religious ways, everything has to go through that lens, right? If you are watching somebody on the stage, maybe a science educator, they see it as a preacher because the authoritarian model is there is a shepherd and then there are sheep. So then we sheep will go in and have this gospel of science downloaded into our brains, which we accept uncritically, and then we go out and parrot it in our own lives. This is the religious model. You get together as a group. Oh, that's got to be church. It's atheist church. I take Jesus and the Bible on faith. You take Darwin and evolution on faith. And you and I are screaming, no, no, we don't. There's a difference. Is it true? Can you demonstrate it? Can you place it under laboratory conditions and show me in a repeatable way that it works? And then if new information comes along, am I prepared to adjust my point of view, my opinion, my position, to allow for the better information. Don't tell me that superstitious, fundy religions do that. They don't walk in every day and say, you know what, how can I improve my point of view on this? No, 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 they don't do that. Don't tell me that atheism is a religion. Okay, just not. The lack of a belief in God is not like a belief in God. It's just not. short break more of your calls as broadcast number 600 continues next you have no idea how much your support means to me i'm very thankful for uh, the sponsors that we have on the broadcast but especially my patrons those who support the broadcast get it early and totally commercial free consider becoming a patron you can choose how much you want to donate per show or whatever every single month it really does make a difference patreon.com slash seth andrews continuing a show that's populated mostly with your calls broadcast number 600 Susie, thanks for calling are you with me yes i am how are you i'm so good ready for good things in 2022 if i was superstitious i'd be saying i'm trying not to jinx it but i uh you know i'm in a good mood (laughs) celebrating show 600 and have some optimism how about you i'm doing very well good i'm trying to get to orlando in march for the free flow convention i'm hoping it's not shut down because of any new variants I think we all are, Um, (laughs) but so far with the vaccination protocols and other safety measures in place, it is scheduled for those who are interested. The Florida Free Thought Convention at freeflowflo.org. It's March 4th, 5th, and 6th in Orlando, 
Florida. I'm going to be speaking. Uh, Dilla Hunty is going to be there. No Illusions from Scathing Atheist, Mandisa Thomas from Black Non-Believers, and so many others are going to be part of the weekend. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Sorry, I had to do the commercial since you set me up real quick, Susie. Well, uh, I wanted to set you up to let people know about it. Good. I have fallen in love with God Awful Movies podcast. And I wish, and maybe you know the copyright stuff regarding it, but I wish they could do it like uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Is it a problem with copyright and showing it, and they would have to pay for it or something? Do you know? Let me explain for everybody. God Awful Movies, these guys go watch these Christian films, really bad films, and then they come back and they dissect them and lampoon them on the broadcast. The problem is, is that unlike Mystery Science Theater 3000 and Rift Tracks, they aren't able to actually play the film and comment on the film in real time. And the reason is, in fact, a copyright problem. This is a proprietary thing. The ownership of the film becomes an issue. I tried this with the Thief in the Night movie. I actually went through and did four films commentary in real time on the thief in the night movies and i had my video in the box did, in the did bottom terrified left. you when you were in school yeah yeah the one that freaked me out i went back and just dissected the thief in the night films took me a long time to put together i posted it and within a few weeks i received a copyright strike and it was removed by the owners of the thief in the night movie and i think this is the same challenge that the god awful movies guys have they're just not able to use the material i think even in an editorial context because they would be using so much of it having to play so much of it but next time i bump into them if i remember i'll ask the question just to be sure but that's my assumption i like to listen to the podcast of their movie review and then watch the movie because i know what's coming up and it's just hilarious my husband will say god this movie's horrible (laughs) I think it's the only way you can get through it. Anything from Pure Flix. How many God's Not Dead movies have come out? Like, how many times do you have to say God's Not Dead? And then you watch them. And I think uh, one of the first film, was it, where praying is supposedly illegal and they end up in a courtroom. And, of course, this is so fabricated. You're like, well, what? when did prayer become illegal in this country? When did worship become illegal? It's the entire foundation. The whole premise is total crap. And yet they continue to produce these movies, and they're making a ton of money on them. Which, That's what I read. Yeah, they make a lot of money. Pure flicks, yeah, they produce them on the cheap. They've got a built-in audience that laps it up. And, oh, look, it's Jesus for profit, <laughs> right? Jesus for profit. And Grandpa changed the professor's mind at college about evolution. You know, it's like... Come on. <laughs> Wasn't it Kevin Sorbo plays an atheist who hates God? God I think, yes. I think he ends up in a car he challenges, wreck or something. He challenges a student to prove God's existence oh, yeah. in philosophy class. And he and comes off like... Of a, course, the kid, the kid doesn't. <laughs> he comes off like a total a-hole, too. I mean, he's just... A, a, the atheist is not portrayed realistically or certainly in a positive life. This is a sad, (laughs) pathetic, nasty, angry person who, at his core, really does hate God. He's just a hateful, hateful person. And uh, is there redemption for the atheist? Tune in, buy our ticket, stream it at this dollar figure, and find out. And Um, and the best is rock. It's your decision. The pastor challenges the teenager to stop listening to evil devil (laughs) rock music for two weeks. (laughs) Oh, the devil's chords, the distortion <laughs> of Satan is dragging yeah, a generation. Yeah, it's a whole satanic panic time. That's awesome. And, um, of course, he convinces his friends to stop listening to rock, too, and it's, everybody goes into the sunset. Well, um, I'll, I'm glad you mentioned God Awful Movies. If um, our listeners have not been aware of the show or subscribed, they're precious guys. They're hysterically funny. And they do at least one new film every single week. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. I hope I get a chance to meet you in Orlando coming up in March. Okay? 
Uh, is Noah Illusions going to speak at in Orlando as well? Yeah, yeah I, I see him as a speaker on the roster. Don't totally hold me to that, but I'm guessing if they're going to fly him to Orlando, he's definitely going to be on stage, and he'll be amazing. He's such a good communicator, and he's a really good man. So I'll see you in Orlando, yes. okay? Thank you. Have a great holiday. Thanks, Susie. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I guessed it on that show a couple of years ago, three years ago. And we did two films. What was one of the films we did? Oh, Footmen. Yeah, if Footmen tire you, what will horses do? Is the name of the movie. It's a Christian propaganda movie that was released in 1971. It was based on the teachings of a guy named Estes Perkle. Estes Perkle was a freak. So he put together these movies, which most of which were a sermon. It's a black and white film shot in 4-3. And he is uh, behind the podium talking about all the crazy and horrible shit that's going to happen because of those evil atheists and stuff, right? And they've got stuff in. I, I, I was there a rape? And they've got a child who has a. They take a, a branch from a tree and they jam it through his throat and they show it. His blood coming out of the kid's throat and all these horrible fetish type things. You know these bizarre scenarios that, to me, I think reflect that Estes Perkle had some really inexcusable fetishes. I, th- I think there's something about him that wanted to see children tortured with tree branches. I mean, there's something wrong with that guy. But we uh, actually did the film as a god-awful movie. I'm sure you can find it if you uh, Google search it. Brian, thank you so much for waiting on me. Brian, are you with me? Yep. First of all, I wanted to say congratulations on show number 600. Thank you. I had actually called, I think you, I don't know if you remember, I called during the moral and ethical, the one that you did back in, I think it was August. Yeah, we did a show on uh, situational ethics where we presented a bunch of different stories and you had to decide what to do next. You know, what was the moral and ethical choice? So I had called, I remember I called during that one and got it. But I was thinking it's kind of funny because like, you know, you were talking about, you know, what you want to see, what, you know, 2022. And it's like, I'd love to see more common sense and as a blind person, better accessibility. Like, you know, everything is just so digital and not everything like that is accessible to us. And so that's kind of the thing I like, you know, and I can't help thinking of some of those, like you were talking about that Estes Perkle. And I'm just like, I don't want to know what that guy got up to. And it's, you know, I hear you talk about some of these movies, like a thief in the night and that and that. And it's like, on the one hand, it's like, I'm curious to see if it's really that bad, but it's like, I don't want to deliberately murder my brain cells. (laughs) If you watch a thief in the (laughs) night, you will die inside. When you're not laughing, you will have your hand over your mouth, wondering how in the world these things ever got produced, and then especially shown to young children. And then you'll get pissed. It's like, you know, because my very first girlfriend was and is a fundamentalist Christian, and that was one thing we used to argue about constantly, because I've never been, a, I mean, even at age five, when I was attending Catholic Church, and I'm 41 now, and it's just like, thank God, pun intended, that it never took hold. Yeah. Well, that's good news. One more free thinker in this yeah. world. <laughs> Brian, I encourage you if, you know, if you're that bored, you know, pull on half of this stuff is on YouTube, especially the older Christian films. <laughs> Give it a shot. And then, yeah. you know, include some commentary. I'm sure the comment section would be wildly entertained. All right. All right. Happy New Year. Having me on. You too. <laughs> right. See you later. 312. Hi, who's this? Hi, this is Al. Al, appreciate you very much. What's going on? Well, I, I don't want to ruin a comforting broadcast with a sad story. I, I did see your post on the professional Thinking Atheist page about that splinter group of QAnon people in Dallas. Um, I'm not going to go into details just because I, I don't know if it puts you in Facebook jail if I say it, but like the QAnon people are, I'm just going to say they're doing something that leaves a very bad taste in their mouths. I'm just going to leave it at that. And... I get the catharsis of the comments. You know, they put pictures of Darwin talking about, oh, let nature take its course, ha, 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 eating the popcorn and all that. But, like, I'm a mental health counselor, and, like, as soon as it goes from, like, ooh, I want to see JFK and the Rolling Stones to, ooh, this drink tastes weird, like, for me at least, it goes from, that's when it goes from comedy to tragedy. Because even the cynical lawmakers are sitting up there, they're vaxxed, they got the mask. They know the science. And they're happy to let their constituents just hurt themselves. 
For those who haven't been following yeah. the story, in a nutshell, hundreds of QAnon conspiracy theorists gathered in Dallas, Texas a few weeks back, believing that JFK Jr. was not killed 20 years ago in a plane crash, but has been sort of uh, sneaking around, waiting to become Donald Trump's running mate for 2024. And uh, when he didn't show up at the parade, they thought he was going to show up at a Rolling Stones concert. And the article that uh, is being referenced here regarding QAnon is about a family of cultists in Dallas, Texas, who have been drinking the equivalent of bleach. It's like a cult, a small family of cult members who are QAnoners, and they are drinking a cocktail containing chlorine dioxide and other substances. And this is like an industrial disinfectant. And we don't know why they're drinking it. But uh, the point is, is that bad ideas result in often dangerous behaviors, right? Yeah. And on the one hand, in the comments section is kind of like, oh, good riddance kind of a thing. But like, I've seen some brainwashed people in my office, in my room. And I had to deal with a client whose wife is going in a really bad direction with it and may end up taking the kids to who knows which state. And, like, it's rough. I just wanted to make the point and get your opinion about how sometimes it's the lack of empathy toward people that we get pushed so far because of what they say and do. And it gets so infuriating. But then when we realize that this could be the end result, I hope that this kind of helps us take a step back and say, wait a minute, you know, maybe the catharsis isn't really the end game. We need to be a little careful about turning these people into fodder for jokes, at least at a certain point. Now, obviously, some things that they would say is crazy. My take is that, and we're not great at this, but you can see somebody as a perpetrator of harm and also a victim. All right, we're not binary thinkers. Human honors are perpetrating often very dangerous and bad ideas, but they can also be victims of brainwashing. These two facts can exist in the same space. And the same goes true with Bundy religionists, for lack of a better word, people who have all kinds of bad ideas. There can be people who hold very hateful and bigoted opinions who are doing great damage, but they are also victims of brainwashing. Maybe they were raised in a cult or in a, an extremely bigoted family, never had a choice, would never introduce to the outside world. I grow a little bit frustrated with some of the more dogmatic who refuse to acknowledge that a lot of these people, they kind of never had a chance and they need to, they, they might be salvageable. They might be rescuable. And we've all been at a point in our lives, I think, when we had a bad idea and we were rescued from that bad idea or found our way away from that bad idea to embrace better ones. So I think while we do point at them and say, holy shit, how could somebody be this stupid? It's easy to do that. You know, irredeemably stupid, JFK Jr., drinking bleach, all that stuff. We also, I think, have to acknowledge that these people are victims. Beyond that, it's not just them filtering themselves out of the gene pool. Oh, I'm not going to wear a mask. I've, if they get COVID, let them die. They just sort of took themselves out of the equation. It's not like that. I think it, first of all, shows a tremendous lack of humanity and compassion. Secondly, it completely ignores the reality that what they do will affect their young children. The elderly, the people they bump into on the street, at the grocery store, wherever they happen to go, it affects the culture, community, society, nations, and the world. We do not live in a bubble. So I take your point that, you know, we can take a hard stand without losing or sacrificing our humanity. Would that be a fair way to say it? That's a very astute distillation, yes, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, Happy New Year, and I hope uh, there's a lot of goodness and compassion and empathy. And, you know, I think if we can keep our heart from dying out there amid all the noise and the shouting and the awfulness, I think if we can retain, you know, if our heart can continue to beat as human beings, that's a victory. That's a good way to put it. All right. Thank you. Thanks for calling. We'll see you later. Spencer, appreciate your call. What's on your mind? Hey, Seth. How are you? Uh, my name is Spencer. I was calling out of Orlando. A uh, really great opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, I've actually been consuming your content for some time now. Uh, you, along with Aaron Raw and, of course, Matt. 
my kind of question I had for you is, uh, do you ever kind of get tired? Do you ever kind of get burnt out of, you know, having to go over the same arguments over and over again with the religious and the creationists, et cetera? Yes, I do. Sometimes I get weary and I'm reminded mm-hmm. of something that uh, Matt Dillahunty said. I think he said it on the atheist experience. If not, he said it over coffee at some point, but he, he said, you know, for me, it's the thousandth time I've talked about this thing, but for the religious person who is being engaged, for them, it may be the first time. You know, when I was in the faith, I was never meaningfully right. challenged. So, you know, if Adam and Eve come up, hey, you know, there's two versions of the Adam and Eve story with a different order of creation. Like, no one ever had that conversation with me. Hey, did you know that the geologic right. column actually refutes the idea of a Noah's flood? You know, I never heard that before. Uh, did you know that there is evidence of evolution in us, in our bodies, that we are the human primates? We're related to all living things. You know, mm. I, I've i never been meaningfully introduced to that. So while it does you know, occasionally make my left eye twitch, I have to remind myself <laughs> that for a lot of people, it's the first time they've had this conversation. And maybe the fact that I've had the discussion in so many instances might make me more effective in the next opportunity. Mm. And that's how I sort of power through it. Right. I, I think I think that really uh, that that really makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've watched. Uh, I don't know. You have probably over a thousand hours here on uh, YouTube. All your speeches, of course, the Unholy Trinity tour. Yeah, just you know, it's really great to see that to really see some beam of light, as it were, to kind of transcend the the ridiculousness and, and make a more uh, more humane and, and, and better world for the rest of us. You know. Well, I think we're all doing what we can where we can. Absolutely. Great talking with you, Seth. Uh, you guys are one of my heroes. I can't appreciate you guys enough. Um, I do actually live here in Orlando, and I, I heard on your show you're actually coming down, so I'm definitely going to look into that. I'll be there, and we'll see you soon, okay? Take care. Right, great talking with you, Seth. Thank you, thank you. See you Bye. later. I did a rundown in one of the speeches that I gave. The speech is called Scrabble on the Space Station, and it sort of uh, pinballed through some of the arguments that we've had over and over and over. The eye is too complex to have evolved. Or it's true because the Bible says so. Or uh, Darwin had a deathbed conversion to Christianity. (laughs) That's a total lie. I've heard the same thing about Einstein. Einstein was a Christian. Have you heard that story about uh, the classroom where the student challenged the professor, proving the existence of God, and the student happened to be Einstein? Uh, That story's total crap. Hitler was an atheist. Yeah, I've heard that one. I don't know how many times. People love to invoke Hitler. They toss the Hitler grenade into a conversation. How could something come from nothing? It's not religion. It's a relationship. I had a near-death experience or a post-death experience. Or I heard a story about somebody who died on the table during surgery and they floated above their body and they saw Jesus. So that proves it. Prove God doesn't exist. For somebody who doesn't believe in God, you sure talk about God an awful lot. You're just religious about atheism. You've killed God because you want to be God. Heard that one. All belief systems deserve respect. Teach the controversy. (laughs) Uh, The God of the gaps. My grandfather wasn't a monkey. They found Noah's Ark. Did you see the photograph? There are no atheists in foxholes. If it's not true, how's it been around for thousands and thousands of years? Ignore the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. Where do your morals come from? You know, I just... (laughs) Yeah, the cosmological argument, the ontological argument, the presuppositional argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Occasionally, I just want to stick my face in a blender. But there are some people who are either wrestling with their own dissatisfaction in the faith, and they're interested in having these conversations, or they're spouting wrong information and they need to be publicly challenged and countered. You know, just because we're tired of it doesn't mean that these aren't important discussions. And that's helped me. It's helped to remind me that, you know, maybe instance number 500 for me, but it might be 
the very first introduction to some of these ideas for someone else. I, I actually appeared on a pastor's broadcast a few weeks ago. And he had a guy on there who was coming out of his faith, called himself agnostic, but he was dubious about evolution, right? And he was like, well, I'm not sure if it makes sense. He was on the fence, but he was genuinely open to talking about it. Well, you you know, I'm a guy who used to laugh at evolution. I thought it was totally counterintuitive. I thought it was just crap. It's a joke. I'm not related to a fish. I'm certainly not a monkey or, you know, I don't have monkeys in my background, blah, blah, blah. But we were able to talk about things. We had a compelling conversation where we talked about things like the hair on my arms and chest being a holdover back to my primate ancestors, the fact that the goosebumps on my arms and neck relate to a time when the hair would stand up to keep me warmer or to make me appear larger in terms of a threat, how uh, we have embryonic tails. You know, human beings have embryonic tails that many, some children are actually born with in rare instances. They still have their tail, you know. I'd rather have the conversations than not have the conversations. I'd rather talk about this stuff than let the people with hugely wrong-headed and often damaging religious ideas, superstitious ideas, dominate the conversation. I don't want them to have a monopoly on these discussions. I want to be a part of it. This is part of the larger machine of trying to build a better world, whatever that looks like, with our feet planted on terra firma, right? We're planted more in the real world so we can focus on real solutions based on real things, not fantasy, not magic, and not all the guilt and shame and distraction that comes with those things. We believe that we are all we have. We've got to make the most of it. Life is short. Carpe diem. You know, there's not going to be manna from heaven. We're not going to see magic come down from on high. We have to solve each other's problems. We have to be the world, the humanity that we want to see represented everywhere else. So, yeah, there's so much to do. There's so much to talk about. It's why, even though this is show 600, I have a feeling that we have many more broadcasts ahead of us. The work is far from done. And for the role that you play, in getting the word out, in challenging not just other people, but also challenging me, being a part of the critical conversations, being a resistance against superstitious nonsense, and more importantly, being humanist, representative of a good humanity, good for goodness sake, you have my deepest thanks. You are amazing. Thank you for show 600. Thank you for who you are and everything you've done. And I will see you back here next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com. 